programs and scripts. So what is the difference between binary programs and text-based scripts? Well, binary programs are basically programs that are files made out of machine code readable stuff. And then text-based scripts are human readable programs. So when you run a binary program, well, there's multiple parts to a binary program, but one of the main parts is you have actual machine code that is understood by the CPU directly. In a text-based script, what you have is human readable code that is interpreted and converted to instructions as it runs. So the binary programs are going to be much faster and the text-based stuff is going to be much easier to read, modify, and update. So how does the operating system tell the difference? Well, there are pieces in the very beginning of a program that indicate what it is. So for a script, they all start with the hash and then exclamation point. And after that, they have the name of a binary program that's going to be run. And then what happens is it reads that it sees the name of the binary program to run, it runs that program and then passes the script as input to that program. So that causes the interpreter to then interpret that script and run it. So how do users tell the difference? Well, it's pretty easy. You just open the file and take a look at it. And if you can read it, it's probably a script. If you can't read it, it's probably not a script. How are they made? Well, you use text editors to create your text-based scripts and you use compilers to take source code that's made with a text, a text editor and convert that to binary. So the conversion process happens with a compiler. So what is a compiler? Well, a compiler reads through a source code file and it will then interpret and figure out what this means and convert it into binary data that can be understood by the CPU. It's the same kind of thing as an interpreter, but it converts it all the way down into binary and stores it as binary. They still have to do the same kind of thing as interpreters because they both have to read what the human readable version is and understand it. So why would I want a compiler? Well, you need a compiler every time you want to write binary or create binary files. And that could be because you need to download some source code someone's provided. You need a compiler to do that. And you also need, if you're going to create programs that are not going to be script-based programs. So which compiler should I get? Well, that depends on what the source code is written for. There are multiple different compilers out there. But the most common one on Linux systems is the GCC compiler. So it's the GNU compiler. And that one is the one that I would recommend, especially if you don't know any other one that you need. Although it is possible there are some minor differences in the source code and different compilers will be required to do different things. So you need to make, make sure you, if you download some source code from somewhere, you figure out if it requires a specific compiler or if it works just fine with the GCC compiler. So building source code. Where can I go to get programs that are distributed as source? Well, a lot of people go to GitHub. You can go to GitHub and you can download source code there. You can also go to other source code places such as uh, SourceForge and download your source code there and get it. Many different people who are creating projects have a source code distribution that you can download as well but then you have to figure out how to build the source code programs. So how do you do that? Well, that can be tricky because sometimes you have all kinds of libraries that need to be compiled and built into it. So you need to make sure you have all the libraries, all the dependencies, everything. You need to make sure you have a compiler, a one that'll work. Then you need to sometimes run scripts on it to then prep it up. Sometimes there are configure scripts that will check your system and see what hardware, what what packages you have, and then customize your build to use that. Then they have make files. Uh, make files, you run the make command, and that will install 
all of the, well, it'll build everything according to the make file instructions. So that seems kind of complica complicated and, and difficult. So why would I want to build my own programs or build them myself? Well, you want to build them yourself because it gets more efficiency or because they are not built or maybe you want to make changes and you can't make changes to someone else's binary very easily. So you need to build them yourself. So how then are our source code projects installed? Well, what happens is if you use a package management system such as an RPM package, it installs and it puts files all across the system in different places, but it keeps track of where they're at. If you do a source code project, you can do the same thing. You can put them all across the system wherever you need to put them. And then you need to keep track of where they're at, or you need to make sure there's some way, some script in there to remove them because otherwise removing them can be very difficult. So what does a hello world program in C look like? And how to use the C GCC compiler to convert source code to binary. And then we'll just look at the make file and then how to run the binary program. So let's jump right in here. So let's make a file. So I'm gonna make a directory first, just make dir, and I'm gonna make this the hello directory. And I go into hello, and now I'm going to create a file. So do nano hello.c. So your C files end up with the C extension, and in it you have to tell it you are using your libraries, stdio, standard input output, h, and then in main, you have to have main function. You can pass the variables here, or you can just skip that and go directly into your main function. And in the main function, I do a print f to print hello world. I have a new line, so it's not on the same line. And, and then I want to make sure I have a return value so that when the program ends, it knows that it returns successfully, return zero. So that's really about it. Um, you can do much more, much more complex. You can add things like uh, int arg c, you know, char, maybe star char, argv. You can do whatever you want here, but you pass in variables. Um, Anyway, so let's go ahead and save that and exit out. Next, I want to compile it. So I need to use the GCC compiler. If I try running it right now, I don't think I have it installed. And it says, command not found. So I need to get my compiler. So I could search for the GNU compiler and find it that way, or I can just do yum install GCC. And that will get it right here, get it all installed. Um, and that's kind of quick. The compiler does take a little bit of time. It's a little bit bigger than the average package, but it's not too hard to install. I get it installed, and now I can try compiling again. So I do a yum install. Actually, not yum install. Do a uh, gcc hello.c. And I take my directory and I can see I have two files now. There's the a.out and the hello.c. So if I do period slash a.out, it runs hello world. If I don't want it to be called a.out, I can change what it's saved as or what it's created as in the command gcc hello.c minus o for output hello. So I want to be I want it to be called hello. So I do that. It creates Instead of the a.out, it creates a hello dot, or just a hello binary. You can see it's the same size as the a.out. If I run the hello, it runs. And the way you run it is because the current directory is not my path, I have to tell it a relative location, which is the period directory's current directory slash hello. So then what's this whole thing about make files? Well, if I do a nano make file, I can go down here and I have my hello. In order to create hello, I need to make a hello. Dot, I need a hello.c file. 
And every time hello.c changes, I want to run this command right here, which is gcc hello.c minus o hello. I can also have another option here, so a clean maybe. And I'm going to do a remove hello. So it removes the hello binary. Exit out of that. So then do a make. And it says hello's up to date. I do a make clean. And it removes the hello. So do a ls minus l. And I can see that hello dot c is there, but hello is not there. So then I do a make again, and it compiles my hello program. So that's how I convert my source code into a binary file using GCC and also using a make file. Gives you a bit of an idea how it all works. All right, how to run the binary program? Well, you want to make sure you tell it which directory it's in, and then you run it. So period slash the name of the binary program. So what does a hello world program look like in Perl, Python, or Bash? Let's go back in here and take a look at each one of these. So Perl, it uses the Perl executable. So if I do which Perl, I can see it's in user bin Perl. Now a source code file, a Perl usually has a PL extension. So I do nano hello.pl. I want to tell it right here to use user bin Perl, use that binary, and then when I run it, I want to do a print, and I'm going to do hello world, world, and then a new line, and a semicolon afterwards to print hello world. This right here basically runs with this uh, stuff in the beginning. It says, okay, this is a script. I'm going to run this program, and I'm going to pass it this entire thing as the input. So exit out, save that. Now I can see that the permissions are not set to executable on this PL thing, so I need to set them to executable. So do chmod 755hello.pl, and then I do period slash hello.pl, and oops, appeal, and that runs. Now let's try it with Python nano hello.py this one's a little shorter well not shorter user bin python print hello world world you don't need the um, new line character and you don't need the exclamation and the uh, semicolon at the end either this will just work like this chmod 755hello.py, run that hello.py, and that runs. Now, bash or shell scripts use the echo command. So I do nano hello.sh, and I don't need to tell it an interpreter. I could, I don't need to, because it'll just assume if it's a text file, it's Got to be run as a, well, as a script. So I do echo hello world. And that's it. So I run that. Oops. Switch. Hello dot hello o.sh and that runs so those are your shell scripts you can see how they look um, the shell script could be done uh, as a I can actually pass it the bash if I wanted to so do which bash which is user bin bash and then do nano on my hello sh and I can put that line at the top user bin bash and it will run the same and there we go all right 
So multiple different ways to write a program and make it work. Standard in, standard out, and standard error. So how do I use a text file for the input to a program? Well, many programs can receive input and you type in input. What you can do is redirect these things. So standard in is whatever you type in from the keyboard usually. Standard out is what you print to the screen. And standard error is what you print to the screen if you can't see things, if you wanted to put out error messages. So how do I redirect from standard in or from a file to standard in or out from standard out into some other file? Let's go ahead and take a look at some of those things right now. If I do a command like a cat, it's now taking input from my command prompt. So I can type things in here and then control Z to end. Well, that doesn't end. Control C maybe to quit. Or I can do control, control D to end. That's what it is. What I can do is do cat then redirect from output, or redirect the output into this new file.txt, and then I can type in things right here, like, hello, new file. Press Control D to end that. Now, if I take a look around here, I can see there's a new file.txt. I cut out this new file and see it has contents. I could do something like ls minus al. And that lists the directory, then I can redirect that into new file, and it will replace the contents. So then if I cat out the new file, it will list what was in the new file. I can also redirect standard in, or redirect it so standard in comes from something else. So um, the cat command, we just saw cat. I can, instead of typing something in, I can say, well, I want to give my hello.c file as the input to cat. And then I want to redirect the output into my new hello.c. So what does that do? Well, it takes the cat command. It sends all the hello.c contents into that cat command, which just prints it out, and then it redirects the output into new hello.c. So if I cut out new hello.c, I would expect to see exactly the hello.c contents. They're the same. So you can redirect the standard in or redirect that. Um, then there's standard error. So if I do some commands, such as, uh, I don't know, um, find, no. Uh, I do ls minus l dev. It does searching there. I could do a grep to search for something. Grep. So I look for the word hello in the etc directory. All files. It some of these things are directories and I cannot search them. Well, I don't want to see this directory stuff, so I can decide I'm going to do this, but I don't want to see the errors, so I redirect the two into dev null, which basically throws it away. And then I see everything that doesn't have an error in it. So there you go. If I wanted to get rid of all the stuff that does look normal and only have the errors, I can get rid of my regular output and just see the errors instead. So that's redirecting file input and output. So let's clear that. Using pipes. Which character is the pipe? If you look on your keyboard, above the enter key, there is this, uh, well, there's a slash usually. It's not always on the same, same place on every computer, but there is this vertical line. So let's use the pipe command. So if I run hello, 
period slash hello, it prints that. And that's nice. Um, if I run a different command, like uh, wc, well, wc does word count. So I can take this and redirect the input into the output, or the output into the input of wc, and it says, okay, we have one line with two words and 13 characters. Okay. So now I want to try doing something more exciting. Let's do ls minus al. That's quite a bit more. I'm going to redirect that into wc. It says, well, 12 lines, 101 words, and 566 characters. And that's nice. But what if I want to do something like sort this? I could sort it. Sort. Well, now this contents, these contents have been sorted alphabetically. Not quite the same thing, but I do that. And then I can run through word count. Same thing, obviously, but, you know, it does sort it first and then runs it through. So you can run multiple different things and run multiple pro programs at once. Just have it pass the output into the input of the next thing until you're done. So that's pipes. File types. What types of files exist on Linux machines? Well, we have these different letters when I do ls minus l. D is for directory, L is for link, B is for block device, and C is for character device. So you can look around and see things. Do file extensions mean anything? Well, they're used by some programs, but they don't necessarily mean anything critical. What does the file command tell me? Well, it tells me something interesting. It tells me what the file is. So let's jump back in here and take a look. So if I do file star, it tells all these files what's in them. So a.out is an elf binary. Hello is an elf binary. C is a C source code, ASCII text. You can see each one of these things, it lists what they are. So elf is the, <clears throat> the Linux file format for binary files because it has not just binary um, code, it also has things like memory and other things all set up in there. And so it uses that. So you got to make sure you know how this, how these things are. If it says elf, it's binary. If it says text, it's not binary. It's text, right? So you can keep track of those things and that can be useful for figuring out what type of file you're working with. So the last thing right here is symbolic links and hard links. So let's take a look at them. So we have over here, we can do a symbolic link. So if I do ls minus, or ln for link minus s, I can do hello, because that's my program, and I want to make it a symbolic link, hello2, and I can do a hard link with the without the s, and do hello3. So then I take a look at my directory. There it is. So the ln does a link. The 2 created a symbolic link. What that does is it says hello2 points to hello. So if I deleted hello, it would be gone. Hello3 points to the same address of memory as hello. And you'll notice over here, there's this number 2. That's the number of links pointing to that actual content on the disk. One, because it's just a link. It's, it's telling where to go. The twos right here are both addressing the exact same space in memory. So then if you edit them, if you edit any one of those three, it will edit the same exact file. However, um, some editors, when they make file changes, will save a new file and then move the new file to replace the old file. So keep that in mind. When you want to unlink them or delete them, you can do um, either delete or remove. 
or you can unlink. So unlink hello, and I look at my directory listing, and I can see that now the hello2 says, oh, there's no hello. But hello3 is still fine because it points to the memory. And the number 2 has decremented down to 1. So the hello2 doesn't work, but the hello3 still does because it pointed to the actual program. And then you can go and remove or unlink things like hello2. All right, so that's your symbolic links. And I think this helps you get an idea of how programs and scripts work on Linux systems. And that's it.